<laughs> so my name is Devin. I'm a newish volunteer with uh, the Evening Rounds team, and I'm a program manager at the BC Centre for Disease Control. Uh, and it's always a pleasure being here and um, just seeing the great topics that everyone brings forward. Just want to get a show of hands here. Who hasn't been to an evening rounds before? Okay, so there's some, some new people. That's great. That's great to see. Uh, so welcome, everybody, to the 15th annual, not 15th annual, wouldn't that be nice, 15th um, evening rounds. Uh, just to give you a bit of background of what, what evening rounds is, it's, um, it's a monthly speaker series. And we really try to focus on healthcare and technology and social media and bring together whole range of people from health communicators to healthcare providers to um, designers even. And it actually sprang, forward, sprang forth from the um, Healthcare and Social Media Canada tweet up group. And um, I'm not sure, how long ago was it that you kind of devolved from that group and started up getting around? About a year and a half ago? So yeah, we've been around for about a year and a half, and um, welcome to tonight. Just uh, a few housekeeping issues and announcements before we really dive in. Um, so the agenda today, we're going to be starting soon, and we'll have presentations till 7, and then we'll open the floor up for questions. Uh, we do encourage you to live tweet, although that could be a bit of an issue tonight because we had Wi-Fi and now we don't, and you may or may not be able to get cell service down here. <laughs> if you do, um, you can use the hashtags eRounds and HCSMCA. Uh, we're also videotaping this session, and we'll be posting it on our Evening Rounds website, um, along with photos from tonight, which our illustrious photographer is taking. Um, so you can uh, just visit eveningrounds.ca um, to view the videos and also uh, YouTube. So for the question and answer at the end, you'll notice that there's some microphones in front of you. If you're um, asking a question, if you could just press the button, the red button, and make sure that it's on so that we can pick up your questions on the video. And finally, we just really like to thank Providence Health for um, giving us the space to, to have the evening rounds in. And also, um, a shout out to Signals, who is the primary organizer of tonight's event. And um, just a reminder, our next evening rounds is going to be um, on April 15th. And so that's the basically the third Tuesday of every month. So um, I will be handing things over to our presenters very shortly, but um, tonight we're welcoming Daniel Presnell and Aaron Goodman, and they're going to tell us all about digital storytelling. Just to give you a bit of a background on our presenters, Daniel um, received his Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from the University of Massachusetts, and then spent the next 10 years exploring the possibilities and potential potential of stories in a number of contexts, from documentary photography and film, to corporate communication design, to teaching creative writing and journalism at Tulane University and Clemson University. He's um, also a community, right now he's uh, the communications manager at UBC's Faculty of Medicine. And then we also have Aaron Goodman, who is a multimedia producer, documentary maker, and instructor in the Journalism and Communication Studies Department at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Surrey, and also in Richmond, BC. During his 15-year journalism career, Aaron has reported on the search for tens of thousands of boys and men forcibly disappeared by government forces in Sri Lanka, the earthquake in northern Pakistan in 2005 that claimed more than 70,000 lives, and also armed conflicts in southern Thailand, Nepal, and East Timor. His award-winning stories have broad been broadcast by CBC Radio, Associated Press, Television News, CNN, PBS, Frontline, World, VOA, I'm not sure what that stands for, and Al Jazeera English. So welcome to both the speakers. And Daniel, you're, you're up first. Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming tonight. Um, this tonight's session has been very uh, is very special for me because uh, this is a topic that I care a lot about, and one that uh, session that we've been thinking about and talking about doing for quite some time. And I am delighted to have Aaron here to share his work. And uh, 
What I'd like to do tonight, and I'm, I'm only going to take a few minutes here, uh, about 15 minutes, which reminds me that I should start my timer because Janelle says I'm slow. So uh, I'm from the South where we do speak very slow, so that's my, uh, my background. Um, I'd like to just give you an idea of the possibility of the digital narrative and the digital story. I'd like to talk a little bit about what a story is and what a story is in the digital realm. And I would like to just show you some examples and connect you to some resource, resources and other places for you to go and take a deeper dive. Um, uh, many of us, some of you may be incredibly familiar with this. Some of you may be newcomers to it. So my hope is to try to balance that, that, uh, those two poles. Um, so instead of making a traditional PowerPoint presentation or something like that, I thought I would actually use uh, one of the digital storytelling tools called Storyfy and to try to piece something together that might resemble some of the uh, aspects and technologies and techniques uh, that you can use in digital narratives and digital storytelling. So I'm using something called Storyfy. Is anyone here familiar with Storyfy or use Storyfy? Um, so it's fast and quick, and we we'll, may talk a little bit more about it at the end, but uh, I don't want to get too uh, excited about that at the beginning. Um, so I just want to start with what a digital narrative is. Uh, Aaron's going to talk about digital storytelling, which is, a, which is an, uh, just one avenue of digital narratives, and it is typically a methodology about first-person storytelling. Uh, but digital narratives can be first person, third person, they can be all over the place, they're, they're quite large. Most people, even my mom, uh, knows Snowfall. How many people have spent some time with the New York Times Snowfall site? Okay. Um, so it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's a giant parallax scrolling media world which uh, has video seamlessly embedded it has audio and slideshows, and because of our screen resolution here, um, you're not seeing it in all its full splendor and glory. But this is a, sort of a high water mark, I guess, uh, although it, it has caused some, some uh, controversy. But Snowfall is a project that New York Times put together. Uh, it's part of the New York Times Interactive suite of stories, which is a really great place to look at uh, interactive stories. Snowfall uh, was uh, quite a production. Um, and you can see that in the first six days, it had 2.9 million visits, 3.5 million page views. Um, it took six months for uh, the writer to piece the story together. There was a team of 17 people working on Snowfall, and that included uh, photographers, filmmakers, coders, writers, uh, all kinds of people, a huge team working together on the story. And uh, I looked around for the budget of Snowfall. I'm, it may be out there, but I couldn't find it. Uh, but my hunch is it probably costs quite a bit of money. Um, so Snowfall gives us an example of just where uh, journalism, documentary, the web has sort of landed at the current moment. And it's, it's, a, it's a really immersive, beautiful story. Uh, it's, you, can, you, you get lost in Snowfall. It takes a lot of time to move through all of the elements and the scenarios and chapters of Snowfall. Um, so for most of us in this room, I'm guessing we do not have huge teams of people that we work with. We do not have six months often to work on one story, and we certainly don't have endless supply of cash. Does that mean that we cannot produce digital narratives? Um, actually, no, uh, it doesn't. Um, I'd like to show you a, a project that I found on Storyfy a while back uh, that really, uh, to me, was impressive. And this is a story put together by UCLA uh, Medical School. They decided to live tweet a brain surgery. Uh, and the way they do it is with Vine and with Twitter. And they piece their story together using Storyfy. Uh, so uh, it's pretty amazing. And uh, I'll just show you a few seconds of it here. Uh-oh. <coughs>
well, we literally we've lost sound, but Vine seven second clips, um, they take us through uh, meeting the patient, meeting the team. They show us all the prep work that's involved. Uh, they uh, actually, it gets fairly graphic in terms of what you see in the surgery process. And uh, it's a pretty amazing story. So again, um, UCLA was able to do this project um, probably with just an iPhone, right? Uh, and so I think while Snowfall is immersive and beautiful um, and, and opens up all of these realms of storytelling, uh, UCLA with an iPhone, a Twitter account, a Vine account, and a Storyfy, in my opinion, managed to do something almost as amazing. Um, you, become, uh, uh, you become immersed in the story of a brain surgery from a perspective I've never even imagined uh, possible. Um, a digital narrative is a story. It's a captivating story. Stories uh, you'll hear more about from Aaron. I won't spend too much time on it. Um, you know probably some of you have encountered Joseph Campbell and the hero's quest. It is the sort of universal model of a story uh, where someone, a protagonist, receives a call to action. Uh, he has to deny that call and say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And then someone convinces him to go on this journey. Uh, through the journey, he's, he or she goes up or down in terms of plot twist and turns. And uh, through this journey and this process, you arrive at some kind of change uh, for the character, uh, whether it is resolved or, uh, or not. Um, the character should experience some kind of change. Um, I'm going to skip a bit. Um, digital narratives, though, are a little different from that because you have a lot of other elements to play with. And digital narratives take their inspiration from uh, a lot of interesting things. So um, the documentary photo essay uh, is, a, is a format that really was pioneered uh, in Life magazine. And this is a uh, sort of early example of that. That was a, you know, a series of shots uh, in sequence in a linear order uh, presented in a print publication, black and white photography. Uh, so again, it, this, this idea of a photographic sequence is important. Um, documentary film is incredibly important to, to uh, digital narratives, uh, particularly this project from the NFB, which was one of the first community-based uh, documentary projects that is, began in the 60s. And, uh, came back over time to, to visit this uh, Fogo Island in Newfoundland. And uh, it's a very interesting project in and of itself. But where things start to get a little more interesting in terms of digital narratives are how we think about moving through a narrative. And uh, digital narratives are really informed uh, by video games and by moving through scenarios as a character, navigating story worlds, and uh, Gamification, meaning that you achieve something as you move through a story. So, so that, that keeps you hooked and keeps you, keeps you interested. Um, there's also a lot of amazing work with numbers and statistics. And in our world in healthcare, we do deal a lot with analytics and things like that. And so how do you make those meaningful? Um, so there is an element of, of how do we present uh, data in, in terms of a, a narrative in an interesting way. So these are all projects for you to sort of explore. Um, why would we bother telling a digital story? Um, well, I think that um, there are a number of reasons why we probably should think about telling digital stories. Um, for one, they present us with a lot of opportunity. So uh, we have, with, uh, with digital stories, the audience becomes an active participant in, in the story you're telling. Um, they have a chance to, to sort of move through the story, to, to spend time in their own way with different story elements, and oftentimes the audience is actually a participant in the story. They can, can, they can provide their own comments, they can share their own stories, they can, they can include their own photographs, their own videos. They really become part of a community of a story. And um, this is in particularly important to those of us who work in healthcare. How can we engage the people who we're trying to reach, whether to improve health or to hear about uh, some of the challenges that, that they're facing? 
Um, so the audience is very interesting. Um, There's a quote here from a woman named Ingrid Kopp, who uh, heads up the digital media side of the Tribeca Film Institute. And she said that, um, she's quoting another guy, Clay Shirky, but she says, media is global, social, ubiquitous, and cheap. And I think that's an important thing to think about here, that um, we tell digital stories because people, the people we're trying to reach, the audience we're trying to reach, they are already involved in telling stories of their own through Instagram, through uh, through Twitter, through Vine. Um, story is, is all around us now, and digital stories are all around us now. And so there's an in incredible opportunity to connect these stories, unlike before. And as well, these stories have tremendous reach. Um, audience interaction, I spoke a little bit, and I spoke a little bit about video games. Um, I'd like to just show you this one uh, example, and you should spend some time with it on your own this week, but the NFB recently launched this, this uh, game documentary called Fort McMoney, and it, it kind of blew me away because I'd never really thought about documentary in this way before, but it is a sort of first-person game. You move through this game, and you, as you move through it, um, you are looking at real documentary footage. You are meeting real people. You are making real decisions in the story world about uh, a fictional place, but, but using real testimony, real people, real political and cultural and community issues. Um, it's a pretty fantastic uh, project. Uh, the NFB Interactive Studio is also based in Vancouver, so you can take pride, hometown pride. Um, one of the other great things about a lot of digital narrative projects, and I think Aaron will really speak to this, is that they have tremendous potential for bringing together communities that are both physical and virtual. Um, a lot of digital narratives really begin with a place and a specific community and an issue that they're facing. And, um, and this is a, is a way to open up a greater discussion, a discussion about that, that place, but about the universal experience of this community and the challenge they face. Um, and so being able to, to, to combine these virtual and real communities is incredible. Uh, this, is a, this is a project put together in, based in Oakland. It's called The Waiting Room. And it's about one specific waiting room in an Oakland hospital. Um, this project has a number of elements. It has, um, it's a feature length documentary. Um, there is a social web architecture uh, involved in it that is an interface for people to, uh, to move through the story. There's a mobile application that allows people who are actually in the waiting room to contribute to the story and to explain why they're there and what they're thinking and doing. Um, there is an interactive platform in the hospital itself, in the waiting room, that's sort of collecting this information and displaying it. And, and again, the website where all of these sort of elements come together. So this is a very complex project, but one that I think is a perfect example of bridging the physical space with the virtual space and cre creating a, this community. Um, let me move back to here. Um, and like I said, social media is giving us a lot, presents us with a lot of opportunities to, to, to create uh, interesting content that is media rich, that is quick and cheap to produce, that has the ability to really have a large reach. Um, this is a vine put together about water, uh, water aid. Uh, again, seven seconds, fairly effective use. Um, this is a Tumblr site, which is called Everyday Africa, which is, again, more of a documentary project, but an interesting project. Um, this is, uh, again, Instagram. Uh, when Hurricane Sandy struck, uh, the Time Magazine took five photographers and they gave them uh, iPhones and Instagram feed and let them go report on the conflict simply through Instagram. And uh, it's a really wonderful set of photographs. Again, there are tools like SoundCloud for you to do audio quickly. You can install SoundCloud for free on your phone. You can record interviews on your phone. You can edit them and you can post them all, all on the iPhone. Uh, so again, what we see now through social media is the ability to create video, 
to take photographs, to record audio. Um, we are, uh, we have at our access all of the multimedia uh, ch channels and tools that make stories rich. That means I'm out of time, so I'm doing well. I'm almost to the end here. Uh, and I apologize for my rapid fire through all of this. Um, this story file that I made is available. I tweeted it out, we'll give you the link. I would really encourage you to spend some time exploring it. And the last thing I'd like to say is that there are a lot of resources to help you to get started. These huge immersive projects like The Waiting Room are, are giant projects and they require tons of planning and a lot of specialized expertise and, and money. But you can get started rather easily just in thinking about the kinds of story you want to tell and what channels you have access to and even using a tool like Storyfy at the Faculty of Medicine uh, where I work, um, we've, we've tried to use Storyfy to collect uh, some recent stories that we've worked on and we've actually thought about those stories from the beginning as how do we tell them as social stories and how do we tell them as interactive stories. There's one here that we just did about a trip um, from our Aboriginal e-mentoring project uh, to uh, who visited UBC last week. And again, this is a very simple thing just as a way to get started. There are lots of other platforms that exist out here that are open and available for you to use. Um, Calbird is a fantastic site, and I think Aaron might even have some work that, that looks similar to that. Uh, Ziga is a crazy platform that I have um, lost myself in many times. It's more on the cutting edge of collage and, and digital, but it's interesting. There are tools like Sc Scroll Kit that'll help you um, with, uh, it gives you a really nice user interface uh, and will take care of some of the more complex coding for you. Uh, and I'll let you really work on the story. Um, and finally, I'd say that there are a couple of great places to go take a look at stories. Um, the first is this new project that the MIT Open Documentary Lab has launched. It's called DocuBase. And basically, it's just bringing together digital narratives from around the web. And uh, there are some, some uh, people who've curated playlists, and they're keeping this up to date. It's a really great place to just go and check out things. There are lots of health um, or, or digital narratives around health that I think would be very um, pertinent to our, to our audience here, as well as some classics. Um, there are a lot of great ones. This NFB filmmaker in residence, does anybody know this project? I'll probably just wrap up with this. Um, this is one that's really close to home for us. In 2004, a filmmaker was embedded in uh, a hospital in Toronto and uh, spent a year there reporting from the sort of front lines of the hospital. Uh, so this is one that, you know, again, uh, is a pretty, pretty pertinent to our work and, and in, the, in the health realm. So um, that was quick and fast, um, but I hope that it gives you a crash course in, in the, this world and gives you some ideas and inspiration for what you might think about doing with the stories that you want to tell. And uh, I think I'll turn it over to Aaron now and we'll, we'll hear some of, uh, about his work. And thanks for coming again tonight. Uh, good evening, everybody, and it's uh, great to see you all here. Uh, my name is Aaron Goodman. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for uh, the great talk and um, for the great intro as well. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that I'm looking forward to learning a bit more about uh, what each of you are involved with, and, and uh, there will be time at the end of the talk for us to have a bit more of an informal dialogue. Um, so I'm happy to discuss informally with each of you at the end. Uh, but just to let you know a little bit what I have in mind uh, for today, for my talk, um, I'm going to talk, as Daniel mentioned, about digital storytelling. And really what digital storytelling in, in my context, in this context for my talk, is really about first-person stories. Um, so I'm going to talk about what kind of stories, about first-person stories in, in, in essence. Um, um, talk a little bit, number two, you'll see a little bit about the inspiration that led me to 
uh, to this work. Uh, really defining what a digital story is in this context, looking at a range of types of digital stories, and giving you a little bit of an overview of how to create them. Talk a little bit about the workshops that Story Turns, which is my organization, what we do. Um, talk a little bit about the tools that we use in our workshops for content production, how to find participants. We're fortunate that two participants, Larry and Diane, from one of our recent workshops are here in the front row. And they've really great, graciously um, come tonight to talk with you a little bit about how the process was from their side. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the ethics and the care that's involved in these workshops because obviously, as you know, um, most of us deal with very sensitive issues, so ethics are paramount. Uh, Larry and Diane will talk about the impacts of digital storytelling, whether it's therapy, and um, we're going to look specifically towards the end at some health digital stories and some more stories uh, throughout. But I wanted to start off by, by posing this question to, to all of you. How do you think we can or you can create stories as individuals or as organizations that are really effective, that are really memorable? Because we just have to look at the data, right? Um, 115 million active Twitterers each month, over a billion people on Facebook, and hundreds of millions of blogs, right? So there's really an info glut as is said out there. So my, again, the question is how can we make stories that people really take time with and, and they really remember and make an impact um, that inform people but also move people? Well, for me, I'm here and I really want to talk about first person stories because those are the kinds of stories that make the greatest impression on me. And Joe Lambert, I'll be referring to Joe Lambert quite a bit in my talk. Joe Lambert is the founder and the director of the Center for Digital Storytelling in Berkeley. And he writes that our ordinary stories become extraordinary journeys. How many of you believe that? How many of you, does that resonate with you, that our ordinary stories really become extraordinary journeys? Well, we're going to explore this together. And we don't have to look too far back over the last year to see, uh, if we look at the story of Malala Yousafzai, for example, the young woman from the Swat region in Pakistan, then it's her story, right, about how she survived an assassination attempt and how she went on to launch an international campaign for the right for girls in Pakistan to be educated, right? How many of you know about Malala Yousafzai? Virtually all of us, right? I'd be surprised if we didn't. Right? So we identify with her and we learn about the issues through Malala. And we learned about the Vietnam War through one woman in particular, right? Kim Phuc, who now lives in Canada, right? And here she is on the right with her baby. And her story continues to this day to move us, right? And it was her story that helped change the tide of public opinion in the United States against the war. And how many of you have heard of the story of Yusuf, the little boy who was set alight in Iraq outside his home in Baghdad when he was four years old? And he went on to get medical treatment in California. And his story uh, made a, such an impression on the world that $300,000 were donated uh, to help him recover. So Gandhi writes that the culture of the mind must be subservient to the culture of the heart. The culture of the mind must be subservient to the culture of the heart. And I truly believe that. I truly believe that stories can inform people in an intellectual way. They can talk and deal with issues, but that emotionality must be there in order to move us. So about 10 years ago, I was really moved, and, and maybe some of you, you probably have heard this story by Laura Rothenberg called My So-Called Lungs. And Laura had cystic fibrosis, and she created a radio diary over a year or two. And I'm going to play uh, some of her story for you. Laura spent most of her life knowing that she was going to die young. 
When she was born, the life expectancy for people with cystic fibrosis was around 18 years. It's almost twice that now. Laura liked to say that she went through her midlife crisis when she was a teenager. When I first met Laura and asked if she would carry around a tape recorder to document her life, she was reluctant, but she gave it a try. Sometimes she wouldn't record anything for a few months. Then there were days when she hardly turned the tape recorder off. Over two years, Laura recorded more than 40 hours of tape. She recorded dozens of visits to the hospital, conversations with her parents, private thoughts alone late at night, and, like this tape, hanging out with friends in her college dorm. So I'm back here at Brown. Classes started on Wednesday. Yeah, thanks. Good to see you. I think that people who know me, who really know me, who are my friends, don't see me as someone who is sick. They see me as Laura, you know, who's a sophomore at Brown, and it's hard for them to imagine, you know, oh, she might not be here in a few years. They know I have CF. They know that it means that you get very sick and that you die, but they see me and it's hard for them to make it real because they don't want to, because no one wants to, because, you know, they want me to live forever because I'm their friend. Halfway through the recording of her diary, Laura's lungs began to deteriorate, and she decided to get a double lung transplant. The transplant was successful. That was a year and a half ago. But recently, it became clear to the doctors, to her family, and to Laura that the new lungs were failing, and there was no more fixing to be done. She left the hospital to spend the time she had left at her new home, the apartment she was renting with her boyfriend, Brian. For someone who had spent so much of her life either in the hospital or under her parents' care, Brian and the apartment had for the last year represented an independent life, the kind 22-year-olds are supposed to have. Laura was always blunt and honest, funny, poetic, and strong-willed, and the way Laura lived her life was also the way she prepared for her death. Over the last few weeks, Laura organized her own memorial service. She decided she would be cremated and her ashes would be scattered into the ocean where she had gone as a kid. She said goodbye to more than a hundred friends and relatives. Laura did just about everything but write her own obituary. And in a way, she did that too. About six months ago, on the very last tape that she recorded for her diary, Laura talked about all of this, what it would be like when she finally died. And it seems right to give Laura the last word. I definitely think about after I'm gone. When I was younger, I used to try and plan my funeral, where I'd want it, how many people I'd want to be there, what it would be like. I've always been scared that people will forget about me. Eight years go by and, you know, someone who's died isn't the first person you think of when you wake up necessarily. But I'll find a way so that people don't forget about me. You know, I'll give friends things of mine that they'll always have. Laura Rothenberg, who died last week of complications from cystic fibrosis at the age of 22. That remembrance was prepared by Joe Richman of Radio Diaries. Yeah. You're listening to all... So if you're interested in listening to Laura's story, it's available online at Radio Diaries. And another story that really uh, affected and moved a lot of people was Tembi's AIDS Diary. And it's also available to listen on, uh, on um, Radio Diaries. So if we were to fast forward 10 years from when those stories were made to about the present day, how do you think these two individuals might have made their stories? Do you think they would have just chosen to keep them as radio? Well, maybe, but they might have also chosen to make a, a complete digital story and used photos and images and artwork and created a digital story. Um, so to define what a digital story is in, in the work that I do, um, it's typically a two to three minute story, right, based on a two to three minute script. And I just want to reiterate that this model was pioneered and invented 
and popularized by the Center for Digital Storytelling in California, where I've done some training. Um, so the participants write a two, minute, two to three minute script, record the audio, um, either bring photos that they have from home or from their photo albums or from online. Um, a lot of the times people, like in our recent workshops with uh, Providence Healthcare patients, people didn't have any photos and that was fine. So we have cameras so people can go out and take photos and we keep the workshops to 10 people max. And the way it works is um, everyone will go out and take photos and then we create a photo bank so everyone can use all of those photos, any of those photos. So we end up having quite a few to work with. Music, we, uh, participants can use license-free music um, in their stories if they wish to help accentuate, lift emotion, etc. But it's not necessary. So typically, br just briefly, these stories are self Relevatory, and what I mean, and what Joe Lambert, who wrote these, this, 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 uh, came up with this concept uh, and this methodology, is that the author typically focuses on insights, right? Things that they learn along the way, surprises that they write about in their own life. For example, maybe someone dealing with cancer realizes that they can deal with the pain or they can come to an acceptance of their inevitability or their fatality. They're mostly in the first person, the personal stories, right? So it's not typical reporting where we go out and send people to report on health issues. People are writing and creating stories about their own experiences, their first person stories. Generally told in a series of scenes. So typically could be a before, middle and after, right? So some people come in and they want to write about their whole lives. And it's just not possible, right, uh, to create an effective story about in two or three minutes about everything. And people are often surprised that when you pare it down to its essence, a two to three minute story about maybe two or three moments can be really, really powerful, right? Less, image, uh, less video, rather. Video can be very difficult to do very well. You know, so if you want to create a story that makes an impact on people, photos. Photos really work well. Music, as I mentioned. And then just lastly, it's really about the intention more than creating a piece that could be on one of those professional multimedia sites, right? So it doesn't have to be for the New York Times multimedia. The, the priority is really the process. Most of the stories tend to be about relationships and characters. So I've done a couple about, one about my mom, one about my dad. Um, those are just things that come up, right? Because those relationships, as we know, have so much importance in our lives, right? Um, sometimes people do them about people who've passed, memorial stories, and that can be a really important part of a grieving process. Uh, there are also different stories about adventures, going on trips, graduating, getting a job, um, about a place, about where I was born, where I moved to, um, the story about what I do, right? In our recent workshop with Providence Healthcare, we worked with a group of uh, patients who were in a heroin-assisted treatment program. And some of the stories were about recovery, right? And we can really, as audiences, as viewers, relate to those stories, right? Because we've all have, hard, have had hardships, and we've all overcome certain challenges. There are also love stories, dream stories, and coming of age stories. So a little bit more about the methodology, right? When people come in for a workshop, there are seven elements, there are seven steps that participants are invited to think about. And we've talked about insights, right? So an insight could be, again, how I learned to make peace with my health situation. Um, finding a moment. Not all the moments, but several moments, but a few moments. What are the emotions? And then again, seeing your story, bringing the photos, the images, creating artwork, hearing the story. Maybe there's some music that comes in. And we've talked about assembling our story. We use software. We've started using a software called WeVideo, which is a cloud-based software um, that's quite intuitive. Um, that So with support, people can get up and running quite quickly. Um, we've also used things like Final Cut Pro and iMovie, but those tend to be a little bit more complicated. Then lastly, sharing your story. 
it's really up to each participant or storyteller where they want to share their stories. Some people want to put them on their social media sites, on their Facebook accounts, on YouTube, Vimeo. Some people just want to show them to their you know, closest people in their lives, and that's totally fine too. So just a little bit about where um, my inspiration for really getting out of the way as a storyteller. I started off about 13 years ago. My first storytelling project was with a group of people in the downtown east side. And as you know, that community has been so misrepresented and maligned by the mainstream press that I found a group of people down there that really wanted to tell their own story. So they created a newsletter to tell their own stories. Right, so then I started going around the world reporting on conflicts again, helping people who don't normally get a chance to tell their own stories. Did a little bit of training with the story for uh, Center for Digital Storytelling and the University of Colorado Denver. And this practice, this storytelling practice for me is really part of a wider practice of mindfulness. Um, and the yoga really helps me to come and deal with these sensitive issues because sometimes it's quite a lot, right? Those of you who work in healthcare know that we have to be grounded in order to, to work with these issues. And I would just say that some of the hallmarks of our work are really, as much as possible, compassion, ethics, and care. So I've talked a little bit about, about content, uh, tools for content production, how to find participants. Uh, well, generally we partner with organizations such as Providence Healthcare, and there's quite an initiation process, a, a, a quite a long period of dialogue, right? Where I will meet with participants and talk to them a little bit about what the process is about, show them some stories, answer any questions, maybe do a little bit of story work, and just making sure that people are really um, comfortable with it and know what they're getting into, right? Um, but in my experience, it's not hard finding people who want to tell their story. I think everybody has a story. It's just making sure people know what they are getting involved with. So just briefly again, the ethics and care. It's really vital that people who come to the workshops feel supported. Uh, we like to have a lot of uh, ideally one-to-one -one support. And we always have trained counselors or support from our partner, partner organizations in case things come up. Um, and, and on that note about what stories to tell, Sometimes people want to tell the most difficult story, and we just think that's, you know, there may be a time down the road for that story, but if it's really raw and if people risk being re-traumatized, then maybe that story can wait. You know, it has to be manageable. We keep the, group, the workshops quite small, so six to ten people max. Uh, a lot of breaks throughout. We eat meals together. We do lots of um, body work and um, fun breakout activities. And we keep in touch with people after the workshops. So how about watching a few digital stories to really give a sense of what we're talking about here? And I think um, we'll go straight to Larry and uh, Diane's story, who were in, uh, Larry and Diane, as I mentioned, were in the workshop that we led for people in the heroin-assisted treatment program, which we just wrapped up. So let's start with Diane's story. How about that? Okay. Diane, do you want to introduce your story briefly? Um, Aaron came to the Crosstown Clinic one day and st started talking to people about uh, what he was going to do with us. And uh, I was interested, and I, uh, he picked 12, 10 of us to do this, and we didn't know what to expect. Uh, so we all met Monday morning. <laughs> And uh, he explained to us what we were going to do. And the best thing about this workshop that, and I've been to a lot of workshops, a lot of things, they let us, they, the, stu the students and Aaron let us do it by ourselves. They didn't have time rules like be back for lunch, do this, do that. They just let us go around and gave us the cameras, helped us where we needed help. But they let it be our project without steering us anywhere that we didn't want to go and all the students were excellent they were just mm. it was an awesome it was a workshop that was well worth attending yeah. and you, for me it really uh, sort of put the last 10 years of my life into perspective and uh, I really enjoyed it I think it's a it's a process that would should be all over um, 
when I heard about this, like my ears just went right up. And uh, as you remember, it was a Saturday, I believe, and Cohen had talked to me about it. And then I talked to you in his office. And you showed me the video of your father. And I thought, Lord, I want a piece of this. This looks really interesting. <laughs> so uh, fortunately, a lot of people put their name in and they had a draw. And I, I was lucky I got in on it. So um, the first day was just a bit of talking. But uh, I had to grab a camera and run out because I had lost all my pictures due to something. I lost everything I owned. And it was my family, my mom, my grandmothers, my children, just, it just, it just devastated me. It just, uh, so, the next day, I, we had a bunch of assistants, and I, I said, no, it was the third day, I said, well, you know, I, I'm telling the story, let's just run down to Kitsilina and see this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we scurried all over the town, and we got back, and it was putting it together, and after she did, you know, when she was putting it from, from the camera into the, the, the tablet, I just realized how immense this thing I had just done. I mean, there's no limitation to this. I mean, hmm. and then when I heard everybody else's, I was just shocked at the stories I was hearing. It was, they, they were so beautiful. Hmm. And to see these people, hmm. you would never compile that with the person. Hmm. Uh, I just thank you so much for that. It was just, it was fantastic. Thank you, Larry. What impacts did these stories have on you? And, and related question, was it therapeutic? It's not meant to be therapy, but was it therapeutic? What was, what was the impact for you? Could you speak briefly about this? And then if there's time, we'll watch one or two more stories and then have a couple moments for a few minutes for discussion. Uh, it definitely was therapeutic because in the emotions of doing all this, you don't you don't really feel it, but once you see everything that you've compiled, yeah, it touches you deeply and gives you a feeling that you're just so happy that you've done that. It's part, you know, you're doing something. It's, it's easy to think it, but to, to see it, it's, it's great. I recommend it. <laughs> and for me, it was um, starting and ending a 10 year period of my life that uh, was really good after all the horrendous things that happened to me in a couple months and then to come to Vancouver and uh, it's just been, I've nonstop been har harm reduction, harm reduction and working and, and to have been able to put it all on screen and include my family and, and it's like closing, closing the, saying goodbye to my husband for one thing because I wasn't there at his funeral, obviously. But this way I'm going back and I, I get to see, you know, say bye to him and close a chapter on my life because even if I say it doesn't bother me, like all that stuff that happened, it does in my dark places it does. And this workshop just helped me put it together. And when I saw it together, I thought, wow, my creator has been there for me all. That old story, um, if you don't tell your, tell your story, someone else will and you won't like it or it won't be told at all, right? Yeah. So yeah, it was it was really worth it. it. It really brought a lot of things centered centered a lot of things in my life, and it's only been a month, and I I see the changes and things I do already, well, and I'm leaving you. on April Fool's Day. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Larry and Diane, for being here and for your kind words. You're very welcome. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's um, watch a couple specifically about health. Then we'll wrap it up and have some time for discussion. Pip Hardy and Tony Sumner in the UK run a wonderful organization called Patient Voices, a digital storytelling group. And they write to humanize healthcare through highlighting the human side of experience uh, of health, illness, healthcare, and the lack of it. So really to humanize it. And that's really our, our intention as well, to humanize. Stories of health, life, death, and disease can offer us deep insights not into not only into the storyteller, but to the storyteller's family and cultural traditions, if we're prepared to listen. So there's a whole range of applications for digital storytelling in healthcare. It could be to inspire change, to simply create awareness, to evaluate research and programs. And who could be the, the, the storytellers? Maybe their patients. 
Um, we're hoping to do a project with caregivers of people with Alzheimer's. Um, so families, caregivers, and hard-to-reach communities, you name it, virtually everybody has a story to tell. So I wanted to play you, um, how much time do we have? Do we have 10 minutes for stories? <laughs> okay, so let's start with um, a digital story um, about Alzheimer's that was created by uh, Alzheimer's Australia. And it's just wonderful, a wonderful story. Just to show you what's possible with digital storytelling. Eu sou filha única. A minha mãe sempre foi a minha melhor amiga. Falava com ela de tudo, tudo mesmo. Fazíamos as compras juntas e ela ajudava-me com as minhas filhas e me dava conselhos. Fazia tudo para a família. A minha mãe era uma pessoa que gostava muito de dar aos outros. Gostava de fazer pão e bolos para a família e para os amigos. Algumas vezes ela levantava-se às quatro da manhã para amassar o pão para a família. Também costumava fazer bolos de aniversário para as amigas do grupo de convívio. Se eu precisasse de alguma coisa, ela estava sempre pronta para me ajudar. Se eu fizesse crochê e me enganasse, ela desfazia e tornava a fazer bem. Ela sempre tentava fazer tudo perfeito em tudo o que fazia. Depois da doença da de demência, notei que os trabalhos dela já não ficavam perfeitos. Com o tempo, só ia fazendo o que ela se lembrava. Por fim, só fazia trabalhos muito fáceis e com muitos enganos. Foi muito triste ver como ela se ia esquecendo, especialmente porque ela gostava de fazer tudo perfeito. Agora, quando a vou visitar, já não é ela, não é como ela era, não consigo falar com ela sobre a minha vida. Ela já não pode fazer nada para a família. Ela esqueceu-se de tudo, do nome dela, quem sou eu e até a sua própria existência. A minha melhor amiga desapareceu. Devagarzinho se foi apagando e já não está cá. Tenho tantas saudades da minha querida mãe. Yeah. So I see some of you may have to go. So what, I, what we thought we would do is um, open the floor to some questions and maybe you have questions for Daniel, for me. Um, so we've given ourselves 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Um, my contact details, I'll also put them up here. So please um, get in touch with me anytime. Uh, but before we open up, I just wanted to mention that my right-hand man for our recent workshops is in the room. Luis is here. He's sitting right there. Luis, could you stand up? Luis has just been amazing, and he's been such a great help. So thank you, Luis. Yeah, he was awesome. <laughs> so I invite, uh, welcome any questions at all. And again, feel free to send me an email and, and like our Facebook page, Story Turns Facebook page, or send me an email. But for now, if you have any questions for Daniel or me, please. No questions? I think they're just... They were bored. <laughs> you guys just told the 
story so well, you didn't leave any questions. <laughs> <laughs> What are, are we gonna? Are they gonna be on Facebook now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, shortly. shortly. They will be on our they Facebook page. Know? Yep. If there aren't any questions, we could watch a couple more. I had a couple more that I would like to show you. One by um, by a health worker. Uh, are you interested? Or we could you could watch them online. It's entirely up to you. Want to watch them? You're okay, they're two. They're just two minutes each. So why don't we watch them? Then, if there are other questions, we can take them at the end. Because they're really quite amazing. So this one is called um, Go Around. And it's done by the Center for Digital Storytelling. One of the things I loved about being a flight nurse was that my opinion really mattered. I was listened to. That wasn't true in every area of my life. Divorce and a walk through emotional battery had shaken up a lot of the trust I had in my own voice, my own value. When I began as a flight nurse, the guy who hired me said, one of my main goals in this job is to leave without knowing anyone who died in an on-duty crash. Sixteen years later, that goal for me had gone down not once, but several times. I was leaving to begin my new work as nursing faculty. I was thankful that I was leaving safely. Just two more weeks till my last duty day. The flight began the same way they all did, pagers beeping, phones ringing, six minutes from sound sleep to blades turning as we flew towards the rural site of a motor vehicle crash. To describe it as a dark night would be an understatement. The reds, blues, and yellows of emergency vehicles were the only lights guiding us to the scene. The pilot switched on the night sun, that huge searchlight on the bottom of the helicopter that would help us find our way into a landing zone. God, they're putting us down in a hole, he commented. As was the routine, all eyes were intently focused out the windows as we descended. I was the only one who saw the brief glint of the wires just a couple of feet below the helicopter. We trained for this over and over again. It got to the point where we joked about it. It's called crew resource management, how to be heard in a situation of imminent danger, how to work as a team. We had all agreed on a code. Go around. I'd only said those words once before. That pilot had ignored me doubted my judgment, though somehow we didn't crash. But if this pilot did the same thing, we'd all be dead in just a few seconds. Go around. That was the voice I should have used in so many other situations with other people. The pilot did exactly what was supposed to happen next. No doubt, just trust. A complete stop in midair, and then a slow, straight up lift out of danger. Wow. Yeah. So it's quite a dramatic example of a healthcare worker, right? But we could see how, you know, health workers in all kinds of environments could, could tell digital stories. So one more from a patient perspective. One question How long has this been out there? That one's been out there for at least a few years. So, but when did, when did this storytelling, how right. many years is that? Yeah, digital storytelling in this form was started about 20 years ago. 20 years. Yeah. By the Center for Digital Storytelling. I mean, it's so endless, the, the thoughts you can go through. I don't feel like I fought cancer. I let my doctors fight the disease. I grabbed on to healing, hope, and blue. But not at first. I'd had a sore throat and been on antibiotics for weeks when we left for North Carolina. I couldn't wait to get back to the holler, to feel intense sunlight and hear the rush of Cane Creek where Will and Ray play fiddle and guitar. We were winding our way up Roan Mountain when I reached for the mirror in the pickup and saw blood dripping down the back of my throat. My heart raced for a minute, but 
that I turned up the radio and let bluegrass drown out my fear. Fear surfaced a week later when I heard the doctor's words. You could lose your voice. You might need a prosthetic to speak. You'll feel as if a bomb has gone off in your mouth. I woke up in cold sweats for nights after the diagnosis. In Baltimore, on a visit to John Hopkins for a second opinion, I wandered into a bookstore searching for a book on natural healing. I started talking to the owner, and when she asked me where the tumor was, I pointed to my neck. The symbol of the throat chakra is blue, she said. It's the energy center that influences voice. And she gave me a slice of blue agate. But what she really gave me was hope. I started seeing blue everywhere. For seven weeks, radiation techs clamped my mask to the table and left the room as Allison Krauss carried me down in the river to pray. And when the nurse started to drip platinum into my veins, she seemed like an angel in blue. Before long, I'd lost my voice and ability to eat. For months, a feeding tube kept me alive, along with the memories of sunlight and music on Cane Creek. This isn't the voice I had before, but I do not need a prosthetic to speak, and my scans have been clear. It's not that I didn't believe what the doctors told me. It's just that I started to believe in something more. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> questions? Any questions? <laughs> so I'll, I guess our job is done. guess so. <laughs> thank you. So I'll be around if anyone wants to chat. I look forward to chatting with you. And just a reminder. Oh, sorry. Do you have a question? Yeah. Maybe I'd like to change or move people to motivate people. Mm, sure. You know, it's entirely up to you, right? Yeah, you use you use it for however you, whatever you want it to use it for, right? If motivation is what you want to do, then that's what you do it for. It's great. I appreciate that. Move, motivate, inspire, educate, research. You, it's endless, really. <laughs> <laughs>